COVID-19 has affected everyone worldwide. How do they do their job? Did they get to keep their job? How do they educate their kids? How do they stay connected with friends and family? And above all else, how do they stay safe in a global pandemic? Each of us has our own story. I'm James Moore and I'm a cancer survivor. I have a compromised immune system that's highly susceptible to COVID-19. I've sheltered in place since mid-March. And in order to not go stir crazy, I've used Zoom to get together with friends and family over coffee and talk about the daily news or laugh together with cocktails and virtual happy hour. But that's just my story. I've invited a few here to tell their stories. Thank you, Molly, for joining me this evening and spending some time with me. COVID has affected so many people around the world. And what we're trying to do is just hear the stories. Can you tell me how COVID has actually affected you? Sure. Um, <clears throat> back when we first all went into um, quarantine per the governor's order, uh, I am a state employee and I've been a state employee for a little over eight, uh, almost two years now. Um, there was no telework policy for the state of California, believe it or not. Uh, so we all retreated to our homes. We took equipment that we could. Uh, my, my role is very data driven and it's very analytical. In addition to that, I also own a consulting business, which I've come to learn from my children is called a side hustle. So I'm running both businesses, our, our full-time job and side hustle. But the challenge was to prove to the powers to be for the state of California that you can still do your job remotely. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you giving some time to this project. We're talking about COVID. COVID's been going on for a while now. How has that affected you? Well, I think COVID's affected me in multiple ways, not just personal life, professional life, goals in the future, as well as my academic journey right now. Just to give some background, I currently work for the state of California. Um, I work for the San Francisco State University. Um, as Actually, I work with new students. So what that looked like for us was having to pretty much transition 4,000 people who expected to be on a new campus to a remote learning experience. So first and foremost, I think with COVID, it, it pretty much flipped a lot of my world in this sort of 180 kind of a coin. Tim, thank you for joining today um, to talk to me about COVID-19 and basically how it's affected you. So let's start off. How has it affected you? I had eight months of living hell, being in a front end manager of a grocery store. Since March 1st, when everything started shutting down, and we were inundated by panic buying. Anything and everything. I had never seen the store that empty because we could not supply it fast enough. So, Angela, thank you so much for joining me today and talking with me about the situation that we have with COVID-19. So the question that I put to you, how has that affected you? In, a, in an odd way, when it first started as an artist, you tend to be a solitary creature. I mean, I tend to I have a studio, I worked in my studio, I did what I had to do. As a writer, I sit down, I write, and even now with the script writing, I may collaborate with somebody, but it's always done electronically. So for the first couple of weeks, there was no tremendous impact because it was only going to be two weeks <laughs> and, and, and that two weeks just kept extending and extending and extending and, and what i found was 
I no longer wanted to go in my studio. Um, and in fact, I ended up storing things in my studio because I, I felt like it was, it was useless in a way that you know, whatever I was creating was, was living in a void. So first off, Jacqueline, thank you so much for being a part of this today. Um, COVID's been around for a while now, and here in the US, we've been in lockdown since March on some sort of level. Can you tell me how COVID and that lockdown has affected you and what it is you're doing? For me, COVID has been a huge part of my life. I'm in the entertainment industry, in the event industry, and obviously our job is to have large crowds, which is the one thing that we shouldn't have right now. So we have had to change and pivot and do all sorts of things in terms of what we do on a daily basis and basically to some degree shut down. Amelia, thank you so much for joining me today. I, I appreciate you taking time out. Um, this project I'm working on is about the stories of how people have been affected. And COVID-19 in some way, shape or form has affected all of us. But yeah. for you, how did it affect you? So I work in a, a fine dining restaurant in Cupertino, Alexander's. Um, I went to work um, one, I believe it was a Friday, I went to work. Uh, there was a lot of talk of, oh gosh, we're gonna have to start wearing masks and gloves. And at that point, there was a case um, that had been um, someone across the way at a different restaurant had gotten sick with the COVID-19. So we were worried that our, not that it was gonna close, but that it was gonna be a lot slower and that we were gonna lose a, a fraction of our income. Come Monday, we get an email saying we're no longer employed. Our insurance is no longer going. Um, basically like a termination notice and that we will have to be when this is all said and done, we'll have to apply to be rehired. Thank you, Jawan Mo, for joining me today. Um, can you tell me, in your own words, what it's like to have to deal with the COVID-19 situation? Okay, um, so you know, from a personal perspective, um, just the non-business owner perspective, the personal perspective, um, it's been a challenge. Um, my two senior parents, so they're both in their 70s, live with my husband and I. Um, and so we've had to be extremely careful about our contact with other people for fear of infecting them. On top of, both of us have um, pre-existing conditions that make us much more susceptible to COVID. So Mark is immune compromised um, and I am um, overweight, diabetic and have had a heart condition, which are the top three um, comorbidities for COVID. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I really appreciate your time. And we're here talking about COVID-19 and how it's affected us, all of us, globally. And you being in another country, mm -hmm may have a different perspective, may have had a different experience. Mm -hmm. But if you could just tell us what has affected you through this entire COVID-19 pandemic. Absolutely. So you're right. So I, I do live in Canada. Um, and when things really started to kind of like hit and happen, you're hearing all the different stories and so forth. I remember thinking first, you know, about my daughter, like, how is that going to affect her? Uh, what does that look like for school? Um, I'm very fortunate from a work perspective. I already got to work from home three days out of the week. Um, and I remember early stages, um, I was at a meeting and they said, you know, take a really good look around the room because the odds are you're not going to see each other for quite some time. Kelly, thank you for joining me today and talking to me about COVID. You're a healthcare professional. You are 
on the front lines right now. Can you tell me what that's like to have to deal with COVID-19 and how it's affected you? Absolutely. So I am a registered nurse. I work on an adult surgical oncology floor. So I work mostly with cancer patients. So as far as COVID goes, what that means for me and my unit is that luckily I don't directly work with COVID positive patients because my patient population is filled with immunocompromised people. And luckily our hospital made a very smart decision and said, we're going to divert any COVID patients far away from your unit. Sandra, thank you so much for joining me today and chatting with me about this whole COVID pandemic that the world's in the middle of. So could you tell me how COVID-19 has affected you? Sure. So there's, you know, outside of the obvious, uh, you know, there are work issues. I'm an outside salesperson. So I have now pivoted, as has my company, to do all of our interactions virtually, remotely. But being a California native and moving to Kentucky three years ago, we find ourselves facing some cultural issues that we had not anticipated when we moved here. It just didn't feel connected to anything. Um, and so what did that look like? You know, okay, how am I gonna manage school with my daughter? Um, you know, being a single parent, you know, you're kind of wearing so many different hats as it is, right? Um, and so what was that going to look like? And then also like, how do I explain this to my daughter? you can't go out and play with your friends anymore. Um, you know, it's very different. Like we had, and I remember early stages too, when some of our friends were still knocking on the door and I just made the decision. I said, there's so much we don't know. I just said, can't. And of course you're scared and you're worried. Are, am I going to get sick? Are all these things that we're doing actually useful? Uh, I have two daughters at home. One was impacted as a student at uh, a local college where she lived on campus. Complete removal from school, everything done online. She's still, uh, she's a junior now, excuse me, a sophomore now and she's still online. My older daughter um, who works for a um, beauty products company has gone through so many changes in her role because people couldn't do the jobs that they need to do on top of having to work remotely. So we were all impacted in a way, not just personally, but also in our school or work life. Like from those very first days, mm -hmm. it affected what you were doing for your employment. Yes, very much so. How, how did that, what, what was your initial feeling to that? Scared. I was scared. People were just panicking. And it was scary to watch it in a public place. Um, our economy should be open and that masks are not necessary. And um, that even if you do catch it, it's like a cold, you catch it, you get over it and you move on. And the older generation who like myself, who has um, thought about once or twice, maybe what's gonna happen to us as we age and being more careful and being more cautious, we are certainly paying attention, but I, I'm finding that the younger generation is feeling quite immune to all this, which is, um, which is really hit home personally for me. Um, and so we were working remote and I was kind of struggling with this self-isolation. I'm a very social person. I've been diagnosed with clinical depression since I was 16. And one thing my therapist always says is, She's like, you are a sham wow of energy, right? The energy around you is what you absorb. And there's no energy around me. It's just me and my partner in the house. And that's something I really struggled with my mental health because my professional environment changed drastically overnight. We are, of course, still affected. Um, we have lots of different policies and protocols that we've been needing to follow and they change on a weekly basis just based off of more research information that we're receiving from the CDC and other um, 
guidelines from our higher ups, our management, our CNO, everybody at the hospital. And we're doing our own research at OHSU as well. I work at OHSU in Portland, Oregon. Um, but it's been really tough. I work at an arena and, you know, unfortunately we cannot have concerts. We cannot have theatrical events. We cannot have meetings. We cannot have uh, industry or trade shows. Everything that we have done and do on a regular daily basis, multiple times, not happening at all. So we all applied for unemployment. I was sitting there thinking a week, two weeks, you know, the 14 day, 28 days at best um, to let this thing pass. And then literally eight months later, I returned back to work. So it's really altered our lives quite a bit, um, you know, on the personal front. So we just don't go out. We don't visit with people. We really just go back and forth to work. Um, and it's just basically for the last, you know, eight months, been pretty much just Mark and I with a very, very, very small circle of friends who we have infrequent interaction with. Um, so that went on until about the end of August. And unfortunately, we thought, as many others, were starting to get the COVID um, exhaustion that we could attend uh, an event outside the house. And up until this time, we weren't really seeing family. We weren't, you know, doing a whole lot, actually doing nothing outside of the house. But we were invited to a, a very good family friend's outdoor wedding in the evening. And of course, masks were required. And we attended this, this wedding and we, the, 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 the three of us who followed all the rules and did everything right, somehow caught COVID at this wedding. It still wasn't quite right. Um, it wasn't about selling your art or sharing your art. There was just something about living by yourself, that confinement. And it really st it just started to wreak havoc. I couldn't sleep. I was awake. I, I was finding myself furiously writing in a journal. And you know, I got good seeds from that, you know, to go forward to work on other projects. But it, it's been it's been very stifling in a way. You've got big staffs having an arena. You've got the concessions. You've got ushers. You've got ticket agents. You have all of that stuff. Are they just not working? Not for us. No, unfortunately not. Even though the unemployment was good money. It's still just that insecure feeling where you don't have any control. It's amazing how that affects a person, you know? Um, from a business perspective, COVID hit at the worst possible time for us because usually um, for bookstores, um, the slowest time of year for our particular type of retail is the first quarter, right? So January, February, and March are really, really tough months for us. Right, and, and it, oftentimes we're having to supplement the store's income with money that we've saved in order to be able to just make rent and you know pay for utilities. And so COVID was really, really uh, scary for us initially. We are very severely shortly staffed because we have such a strict protocol on coming to work with any set, sort of symptoms cold, sore, runny nose, all kinds of things. We can't come to work and so we are just so short staffed because of it. And the patients are just so sick because we're only allowing the sickest of the sick in right now in order to try to keep beds open for the COVID patients coming to other units. It's moving here from California to Kentucky uh, with family being here, we had assumed there would be this, you know, just smooth transition of, hey, holidays and lifestyle, and and now geographically because we're closer, we are we are going to be able to rebuild our relationship because you know we had that distance, which did make it challenging. Well, here comes COVID, here comes the pandemic, and um, I've got family that are in the younger generation. And they, like their environment, are not necessarily taking the pandemic seriously.
I think the biggest change, and, and there's actually actually been some recent developments in how COVID, had, COVID has kind of affected me personally, but I received a layoff notice from the state of California on uh, September 8th. They gave us 60 days and said, you know, by November 8th, you will be out of a job. And I just spent the past six months transitioning new students and, 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 you know, getting them signed up for courses and getting them excited to go here. And then the next thing you know, I'm losing my job after spending months of dedicating time to enrolling new students when our enrollment numbers drop drastically. This pandemic isn't about this country or that country or anything else. It's about each and every one of us being mm -hmm. able to navigate through this. And you got deemed an essential worker. So now suddenly you're being almost, I won't say forced to work. Right. But you needed to be there. We mm -hmm. needed groceries. We needed stuff that wasn't on your shelves. Exactly. <laughs> so were there instances where the customers were not behaving well oh yes we still have it that's so unfortunate i know we're we're just trying to help them and they've got to be rude it... you know and then <laughs> on friday we ran out of pumpkins carving pumpkins it's halloween it's halloween they were coming in yesterday do you have any more pumpkins no i'm sure you've got some in the back i said no so you know having been a cancer patient uh, I, I get the whole immunocompromised issue, which scares me to death to be out in this yeah. stuff right now. How does that affect the patients that you're seeing since are they allowed to have visitors? Do outsiders come in and actually sit with them? Yeah, so at the very beginning, um, the hospital shut down all visitors. Nobody was allowed to come in with the only exception being um, if a patient was um, in hospice, they could have family members at their side for end of life and um, for like newborn babies in labor and delivery. Those were some of the only, uh, I guess, things that would be allowed for vol or visitors. Now they allow one visitor for our patients. It has to be the same person for the entire hospitalization and they try to say, don't leave the unit unless you absolutely have to. Shame on you, you went to an event, you shouldn't have gone. But of course, thinking that here we are, we're doing everything right, we've been doing everything right, we're gonna be fine. And we honestly believe that. We feel um, like we are at risk. You know, I'm in that age group that is now considered elderly. Is, is that what they say? Anybody over 50 is elderly, I think. and. Um, and we have actually had to uh, uh, adapt our lifestyle to not include family during this time. And it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a little sad. It's been a little isolating. I believe, you know, as, as, as an individual and as an artist and so many other things in my life, I value free speech. And I felt like free speech was being taken away from me. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care who you sleep with. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care. It's not my personal business. I have to respect the fact that you do whatever you do, just like you have to respect what I do. And I felt that that was getting lost. And I felt as an artist, that voice was, was being crushed again. Uh, and this is when the testing had just really started to be more widespread, more open. So I went to Cal Expo. And I drove through a maze um, of pylons and, and borders and barriers. And the place was run by the Army Corps of Engineers. So I felt, I felt completely dystopic. And it was as if I, I was a bad person and I was being punished. And they were saying, go here and do this. And, stop your car and turn off your gas and wear your mask and here's your number and hold it up and don't open your windows. So let me, let me swing this to another piece. Okay. I have a compromised immune system. I'm a cancer survivor. Right. I am scared to death 
to step out in public. I have isolated to the point where I have not been social or out around people since March. Mm -hmm. You're out in that public every time you go to work. How does that make you feel? I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I just had to dig my heels in and just do it. So it's a, Basically, it's kind it of was, pull up the bootstraps and get the job done. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how I had to look at the whole thing is it's, you've got to be there. And it was a little bit of a struggle. So I found myself, as I said, going back to playing with photography, going back to designing jewelry. I found myself knitting. Everybody I know now has a quilt or a sweater. You know, I was like, boom, 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 boom. And it was still that, that feeling that you, you were, that you lost something. Uh, I, I have a, my mother-in-law is uh, advanced in years. She has a lot of uh, pre-existing conditions and she's the one I worry about the most. How do we keep her safe? And she moved from daughter to daughter to daughter's house. And each daughter has a different lifestyle. And she has, I know she has exposures at each of these places. This is, we're working, I I'm, 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 have family members who get it and don't get it. And there doesn't seem to be any sort of checkbox here that we can, or a list that we can check off and say, well, we're doing this, this, and this, and we're gonna be fine. There isn't. I mean, I thought I was doing everything fine and I still got it. My family were very tight as it is. Um, and then we just figured out how do we now manage this? So doing a lot of Zoom calls and we'd made sure that was a conscious effort that once a week as a family, we were all on the Zoom call doing, you know, checking in with one another. How's everybody doing kind of thing? Um, I'm fortunate if I still have both of my parents, um, but they're older. So again, knowing that we couldn't see them. Um, and I remember there was one day Madison's like, you know, mom, why don't like, cause the, people were doing different things for birthdays. You'd drive by honking horns and you'd have these different signs. She goes, what if we make a sign for Nanny and Papa? And so we did that. You know, we went by their place. We had the big sign. They were waving out the window. Um, and I'm like, well, we could touch on like, and help other people like not feel so isolated. Um, so my very best friend, um, she lives with her mom. Unfortunately, she has actually passed during COVID. But prior to that, you know, Madison's like, well, let's, let's go drop over there. So we, I told her, come pop outside with her and her mom. And her mom was crying because we just, we had this sign out saying like, you know, we love you, you know, please be safe. And um, different, you know, certainly going through all these, these new changes, but I also saw like a really good side of how we could touch so many people's lives. Um, you know, my, my birthday party was on Zoom. My best friend's birthday party was on Zoom. Um, it's, I went to a baby shower. Right. <laughs> right? And like, I, I went, weddings. I've seen, I've seen weddings. I've seen, so I, I think if, for me, it's been really hard to, um, it's, it's been hard to navigate because it, it is this only tool for socialization, but it's also where I work, where I go to school on zoom and it's my only tool to socialize. It's like, Oh my gosh, I, I, it's exhausting, but I'm grateful for it. It's a very strange <laughs> mix of emotions around zoom. But I think for us, it was, you know, really in the beginning, it was, it, it was around, all right we need to keep this sense of community going. And if we got to do it on Zoom, then we got to do it on Zoom. I did enjoy the time extra with the kids because I have two little ones at home and it was kind of a blessing in disguise to have that time. The only thing that really came out of it that was uh, beneficial was that we learned that we could put all of our inventory online um, from our vendor who provides the inventory tracking system that we use. So we were able to turn on our inventory online. And so we saw an immediate boost in sales from our mar online marketplaces, which sort of stabilized the store. So in a lot of ways, that was, uh, that was a positive because- Has your local government, your company, 
given any indication that where you're at right now is going to change anytime soon? It's a day by day for us. Um, we're in a new, unique position um, because I'm technically employed by what is considered a technology company uh, that happens to be in the event industry. We have used this time to pivot and focus very heavily on developing software and developing um, best practices and other options to be used for, for our clients. Um, and we have seen increases in some schools have been able to hold limited events. You've got somebody at home to take comfort with. You've got your pets. You've got your, your school. There's a lot of people out there that have never been this isolated before, even in their own family. All these people who are, were in bad relationships or in domestic violence situations or who were um, recovering addicts. This is the, although we've been doing this since March, this is the stuff I still think about because I don't know if it's been addressed as it should be by a, by a voice that is strong and firm and kind and comforting and can really fill in that void, whether you've been sick or not, can really fill that void of, yeah, I really feel like we're gonna be okay. It made, Dr. Fauci the other day said, it, it, we're in for a lot of hurt. How much stress do you feel as you're going in to do your job? Because that's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. Very you, stress. Very I stress. mean, I've developed chronic vertigo through all this. And I used to have minor things would go like this. Now the whole room is going like this. And right before I go in, I have an attack and I have to just tell myself, stop, it's gonna be all right. <laughs> Cause I'm fond of saying we're all born artists. That's my tagline. That little guy comes out and is like, I'm here. And you, you sit there with a box of crayons and you do something. So during the time, like they let you go back in March. It's now the first part of November, right? So we're talking yeah. eight months almost, eight months. right? How, how was the restaurant doing curbside during that time? Were they, they were doing, doing to-go's and essential packages. I have to give it to um, the Alexander's restaurant group. They really thought outside the box. Um, they were doing really all sorts of different packages. Um, they were doing all the different DoorDash and Uber and all that stuff. So they really thought outside of the box and like adapted quickly to keep their head above water. And they did, thank God, because now we all have a job to go back to, which we're very grateful for. Kelly, is there anything else that you feel you want to be told of this whole COVID experience you've gone through? I don't know. I just, you know, I look around at everybody who's going out and partying and I know it's really, um, we all really want to get out there, but it's just so hard for me to watch other people do that when, you know, we're struggling in the hospitals and I just wish people could, could look inside our units and our COVID units and see what's really happening and just understand and like do their part. I know it's hard and I know we've been doing it for a very long time, um, but you know, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and it's just getting worse day by day. And I just want to put that out there. You know, stay home if you can. We've got the holidays coming up. That's really impactful. I myself, <laughs> I'm going out and buying a turkey and that's it. And you know, here we have a holiday coming up and it's going to be very interesting to have to deal with saying to somebody, yes, it's a holiday. Yes, you know, we're not working. Yes, you know, we're going to be home, but no, you can't come over. I was just going to say that. It's kind of <laughs> weird when we have this global pandemic right. that, that has us with the numbers of cases and deaths that we have, yeah. yet silver linings seem to get found. I say the biggest one for me, I think when I think of silver linings in COVID was like, 
I was moving to San Jose, but working in San Francisco, I was going to be commuting 45 miles in the direction of the worst traffic. I haven't had to commute once. I, I've saved hundreds of dollars on gas. I've saved hours a day on commuting where I can now spend it dedicated to, that gives me an extra hour and a half, two hours to read for my program, for my master's program, as opposed to just sitting in a car on 280. So it's these weird silver linings like that, I think that I've kind of tried to grasp onto of like, oh, wow, I, I, I don't have to commute an hour and a half each way from San Jose in the worst rush hour traffic. I don't have to spend on gas money. I'm, it's odd to say that there are those silver linings in those moments, but there are, yeah. Mm, I just want it to be over with. Somehow, some way, there's got to be something we can do. That everyone, you know, you hope that we all play a part. Yeah. And, and you literally are living that part right now. You're, you're checking in and giving them symptoms. You're giving them updates yeah. on you. And you're, you're literally playing a part in what will be the future protocol that healthcare follows. How does that feel? Because when I was um, a cancer patient, right, right. I, was, I was in an experimental program. Okay. There were no guarantees that I was <laughs> going to be healed from, you know, playing a guinea pig. And that's exactly yeah. how I called it. And okay. I know that there's an emotional toll that I went through being that. Sure. How, how does that feel for you that you're playing that part, that your, your key to all of the testing that's going on? Mm. When I first uh, signed up to take the test, I knew this company, I knew what they did. And that's why I chose the testing site. That's why I chose that process because I knew that they were on that path. They were providing those services, um, not just to us as, as patients, but to the medical community, to science, what have you. And although at the time I felt really icky and awful, I thought, I can, I can do this. I feel... I don't know, I just feel like I needed to, you know, stay connected somehow, stay like this is real. Um, I didn't, at that time, I didn't have a doctor I was going to regularly. I didn't want to wait in line at the, at the, the ER or the hospital. So this was an option. And then they provided a framework where you could report in. So once I did that, these people were very, very professional, very kind. Every interaction I have with them, whether it's just strictly online or there's, a, 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 you know, an online chat, it's always the concern about, the, about me. And then they guide you through all these questions. I'm, my God, it's the same questions every week, but I'm answering pretty much the same way every week. So you can see there is a history there. I, you, it's hard to try to cheer up everybody when you yourself have kind of kind of got that that kind of feeling. But like I said, that little guy that was in you when you were a kid and they had that first crayon and wrote on the wall until you got yelled at comes out because what you are as an artist is incredibly important in a much broader scale than than you realize. You have no idea what impact you're going to have with a word, a poem, a photograph, a painting. Artists are very important and they're very reflective of what's going on and, and they're very needed. And, and that's the thing people have to realize is that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We have to believe that, but to suppress the arts is not the way to do that. My daughter's absolutely amazed me through this process as well. I remember first going, okay, Madison, like, we're at the grocery store. I know, mom, because I would have the same speech going in. She's like, can I get it? And she's adapted quite well, I have to say. Like, there was never an issue of, oh, I have to wear a mask. Like, that was never an issue. Like, she, I think she's got an old soul. I think she gets certain things that, 
there, there, there's a certain maturity about her where there's the other whole other fun side but when it comes to certain things she just really she can jump on board she gets her head wrapped around it and I also think you know we growing up we were taught the same thing like whatever whatever we have to face we do it together as a family so I've always said that to Madison like whatever we have to face we will absolutely get through this but we're going to do it together right and so whatever that looks like but it's just you know you, you just have to adapt I, I know we don't like it we all want this to be done because we all don't, we, you know, we want to go back outside. We want to go and enjoy things. We want to visit our friends, right? I want to be mm -hmm. on a plane again. Um, those are things that I'm just not ready to do at, cer at certain, at certain points, uh, you know, going through this process. But yeah, I think it's just a matter of doing the best that you can with, with what you've got and trying to make it fun. So Jacqueline, is there anything else that you might want to put into this conversation that I haven't brought up or that you had a chance to say? I, I think one of the realizations that we've all come to is how much the entertainment industry or the event industry actually plays a role in our lives, whether it be from attending a concert to attending a trade show to attending um, workshops and seminars that our work has put on at the local convention center. Um, it truly has opened my eyes as much as I'm in it every day as to how much we actually do and how much this has affected what we do. When we were able to start doing curbside pickup, most of our customers use our online stores to sort of hunt and pack for what it is that they want and then they call us and then they place an order and then they come and pick it up here, right? So they avoid the postage fee and we avoid having to pay the fee that we would pay, you know, essentially a finder's fee that we pay to Amazon and a books, right? So it's a win-win for everybody, right? So they get to see the inventory. They basically get to shop the store from the safety of their home. I appreciate your time today. Is there anything else that you think you need to say that I may have not gotten out of you at this point? Just be kind to your servers. They're putting themselves out there. Oh, I love that. But Thank people you. are. We, there's some good people around. That's nice. They really are. Amelia, thank you so much. Oh, it's uh, been a pleasure. We know, you know, like you mentioned, you're in an environment there in Kentucky that is different, you know, ideologically to other places. But that isn't unheard of in places like Washington, like California, like New York, right? There's, there's a whole contingency of people that have that mindset that this is just going to go away. Do you think it's going to go away? <laughs> no, no. And you know, it's, it's not expected to go away. It is not rational to think it will go away. This is so new and so different. It isn't just a, a, a virus and a vaccine. It's a way of life. And that's why a lot of people are fighting so hard. You are being incredibly brave and taking care of yourself. But can you imagine all the people that aren't doing what you're doing, who are already at risk for whatever, if they're smokers, they're drinkers, they're, they're addicts, they have high blood pressure, they are obese. They have a medical history that lowers their immune system, those with lupus or MS, uh, and are not taking this seriously. As we continue forward, we're obviously not out of it yet, but as we continue and find the next steps and the new world, right? The new office environment, right. do you see it going back to the old way or do you think there may be a point where these lessons learned, these positives from a productive standpoint, mm -hmm. may be implemented in that new design of how work operates? I think we are going to see a huge transition in our workforce <clears throat> um, because we we kind of were able to prove to ourselves that there is a different way than what we were doing before so i just can't imagine that 
people like myself and you and folks who who have been in and out of the workforce our entire lives and kind of seen interesting transitions this is the most <laughs> i mean just transitional period of this country globe has probably ever seen since the 1918 pandemic so i think i can't imagine we'd go back to the way it was and and i think using again myself as an example we've this whole process of like transferring orientation online literally says to us we're now going to have an online orientation forever at sf state in addition to this on campus so that's already the easiest thing that i can say that that is already a change from before right i just i can't imagine i can't imagine people won't advocate for themselves after this experience and say you know there is a different way there is a different way and we did it i created a soapbox and a platform i'm going back behind me as a vocal booth i'm going back to podcasting i'm going to make that noise because i not that i'm the most brilliant thing or what i have to say is the most entrenching but i think it's it's important that like what you're doing we 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 express ourselves and we let people know and artists give you artists can give you hope artists can bring you tears artists can be all kinds of things but ultimately they bring you truth and i think i think that that's the thing that i have to keep in my head to know that there's a truth there and it's hard it's it this is this is hard i'm 62 years old man i never <laughs> thought i'd be doing this crap and it's and it's very difficult so i don't know i feel like it's for the greater good. I would love to be involved. I'm happy I'm doing this. It gives me something else to shoot for <laughs> on the other side. First, I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. I think what you're doing is amazing. And um, I think exactly what to you just, you know, what, what you had just said. As long as we're all thinking not only of just, you know, what's happening with ourselves, but with other people, if we all do the right things, we'll get through this together, but we'll also get through it faster. I, I think that there's an end in sight, vaccine, whatever that looks like, but we have to work together to get there. Otherwise it just, it either will really prolong it or who knows. Artists are very important and they are very reflective of what's going on and, and they're very needed. And, and that's the thing people have to realize is that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Is there anything else that you want to leave kind of as a parting comment? Um, love yourself. Love those who are near you. Check in with people. Make sure that if you have something you think you need to say, say it to whomever you have to say it to. Um, Participate in life as much as you can and as a safe social media, texting, letter writing, pen pals. Uh, stay hydrated, take your vitamins, get some fitness, meditate. All of these are like cogs in the wheel of how we all, we're all faced now with finally taking, we have to really take good care of ourselves inside yeah. out. All the, all the points and you cannot expect this to happen over to end overnight. It will not. And uh, just be kind to yourself. Honest to God, there's days when I just say, "I'm done. I'm just going to sit on the couch and uh, let this fatigue pass, let the cough pass, let the fever pass." There's absolutely nothing that I have to do that uh, requires as much effort as um, getting healthy again. Well, I do, wear your mask. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. I do wish you healthy and I will hold you, you in my heart. And thank you. Likewise. I really do appreciate you taking the time. It's my pleasure, James.